than one week to the Iowa caucus. So joining us with an update on the ground is national affairs correspondent for The Nation, John Nichols. He joins us now via Skype. John, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's great to see you. It's a great pleasure to be with you both. Absolutely. So, John, uh, you were, we were just telling us during the break that you've been particularly trailing AOC uh, on the ground in Iowa. So tell us about what that experience has been like, given that so many of the senators are stuck here in Washington for the impeachment trial. Yeah, I got to tell you, if you're running for president uh, and you can't make it to Iowa, send AOC. Uh, <laughs> whoa. Uh, it, the fact of the matter is I have covered presidential campaigns in Iowa uh, going back a very long time. In fact, I dare say, and this is a horrible way to say it, I think I was covering presidential camp politics in Iowa before AOC was born. Wow. Uh, so I've seen a lot of it. And I've seen when a strong candidate hits the ground, uh, what the response is, how people line up, how they stick around, how they want to ask questions, how they want to listen, and frankly, how they want to embrace and hug and get their picture with that candidate. AOC uh, has all of that now as a non-candidate. Uh, it, it, I was at an event in Cedar Falls, Iowa, where people were lined up, you know, out of the hall, out of the ballroom, uh, hours before she got there. And I'm not saying that it's all for her. I think a lot of it is for Bernie Sanders, the candidate that she is uh, backing. But uh, I cannot emphasize what a powerful surrogate she has turned out to be for Bernie Sanders. It's, it's really quite striking. Mm. The thing that's interesting to me about that dynamic is there was an effort early on, and I think that continues in right-wing media, to paint her as a creature of just like urban America, right? That she can't connect outside of her little borough in New York City. And I think what you see with the response to her in Iowa and other places across the country is it just exposes how shallow and hollow and ultimately wrong that analysis of her appeal is. I think you're totally right about that. You know, when after she was nominated for Congress in 2018, uh, I went and followed her on a trip to Kansas where she campaigned with Bernie Sanders back then. And I think people should understand that she and Sanders have worked together uh, for a very long time. Uh, she went down to uh, Wichita and Topeka and other places in Kansas. I, I met farmers who had driven in from rural Kansas to see AOC, hmm. right? And so I think she is a national phenomenon, much as Sanders is. In American politics, there's a tremendous number of people who've been deeply frustrated for a very long time by a lack of articulation of their views and their values. That there are genuine progressives out there in every part of America, including the most rural areas, um, who have longed for somebody to talk about Medicare for all, free education, and frankly, also notably with Sanders, farm policies that, that support working farmers. So, John, tell us also about some of the other candidates. You've, you've seen Elizabeth Warren. You've seen Joe Biden. What is it like to see them vis-a-vis -vis what we're seeing with Sanders? What's the phenomenon like, the voters, the demographic? How does it all differ? Well, it is different. Um, there's no question that Sanders draws the young folks. Uh, and not all. I mean, Sanders events have plenty of uh, people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. But... Um, if you go to a Sanders event, you're going to see a lot of young people, and they are very energized. What was notable about the Cedar Falls event that I went to on Saturday was that it was a big event, and it did have AOC. It also featured Michael Moore, who was very effective surrogate, and it featured uh, Mark Pocan, the co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, also a very effective surrogate. So it was a you know, big event, a lot of speechifying and everything. The event finished, and I was walking out. I think I was talking to Pocan. Uh, and, uh, and outside in the hall, in the kind of open area outside the ballroom, there's probably a good 100, 150 young people sitting around getting training to go do doors, right? Hmm. So this wasn't just an event. This was also uh, a way to kind of get people excited and then to send them out. That's very effective politics. That's smart politics. Now, in seeing the other events, I want to emphasize everybody's drawing crowds in Iowa. Uh, Biden draws crowds not as big. I, I don't. I think it's very notable that his crowds don't seem to be as big. Warren is drawing substantial crowds, and she has a real base of supporters. There's no doubt of that, and they're they're energized. And if I could just go down the the poll numbers a little bit uh, and emphasize, Buttigieg's crowds are great. They tend to be somewhat older, uh, hmm. but they really really look like caucus goers. If mm -hmm. you get my drift, yeah. Um, Buttigieg has got something going on there. 
And then finally, although I, I, I think he might fall a little bit short uh, uh, as regards the numbers to get actual caucus, to get real traction at the caucuses, I'm not sure yet. Um, Andrew Yang is drawing substantial crowds, and they are excited about it. The people who come to see Yang really are interested in what he's doing. Yeah, I mean, that's something we've been talking about here on the show is in some ways, look, he's an anti-establishment candidate like Sanders is. Both of their theories of the cases, they're going to pull in infrequent voters, people who have never voted before, new young voters. And that's something that's hard to capture in a poll. We do have the latest um, Real Clear Politics average of the polls in Iowa, if we can throw that up. And you can see Sanders leads at 25 percent and then Biden, then Pete Warren. Klobuchar has also made some moves here. Here, though, in recent days, the New York Times endorsement doesn't seem to have done that much for Warren, but it does seem to have moved Amy up. Um, what do you think of her positioning? And um, do you, who do you think is poised to outperform the numbers that this polling average is showing right now? Sure. Uh, Klobuchar has moved up. And I got to tell you, as much as I respect the New York Times, the really important endorsement she got was from the Quad City Times, which is right. a daily paper in Iowa. And this is something people need to understand. Um, there weren't that many Iowans sitting around waiting for the New York Times endorsement. And frankly, the New York Times endorsement was, was poorly constructed. You don't endorse two candidates, you endorse one. Um, so right off the bat, we take that one off the list. But put the Quad City Times on, on the list and put the Des Moines Register on the list, which on Sunday endorsed Elizabeth Warren. Those are important endorsements in Iowa. Now, as regards Klobuchar, she has some traction. But remember, that 8.5% you saw for Klobuchar is almost seven points below what she needs to have in a caucus to start to register, right? You have to be at a 15% threshold to, you know, really start to move up the ladder of getting toward getting delegates. Uh, your votes will be recorded, but that 15% is the key. Uh, Klobuchar is well below that. And so one of the things you have to ask yourself is where would Klobuchar backers go if they went to the caucuses and they didn't have the critical mass? to get to that 15%. Who do they move over and caucus with? Now, I think that, I think Klobuchar people will go a lot of places, but some of them will probably go to Warren. Um, and I think if Warren's smart, she will make her appeal to them. Some also will probably go to Biden. Now, as you go down that ladder, here's where it gets really interesting. That 3.5, maybe 4%, maybe even more for Yang, I think there's a really good chance a substantial number of them, if they don't reach critical mass, go for Sanders. So suddenly you see Sanders, instead of at 25, at maybe 28 or even 30. Right. Um, and this is the important dynamics. Iowa is a complicated place to cover because it's not just about being in first. It's also about being the person who other folks like, right? Being right. a second choice can matter as much as being first. Yeah, huh. we've tracked those dynamics very closely here. John, yeah. thank you so much for this analysis. It's fantastic. Really appreciate you joining the show. Great to have you, John. Thank you so much. Next up on Rising, we dive into the brewing DNC nominating scandal with Nomiki Konst. That is next.